They say a week is a long time in politics, and this past week has been tumultuous. Started off with a protest on Nkrumah's birthday, three-day protest by a group who captioned the demonstration, the Occupy Julobi demo, interrupted by a massive rain that led to flooding. And then the big one, <laughs> Alan Chermating, Monday announced that he was leaving the MPP and he was going to lead an independent movement. He's here to talk to us. Welcome to the show. Good evening. Thank you, Bernard. How are you doing? Not too bad, and you? I'm great. Well, you look, you look uh, very good. You look sporty. I'm following your footsteps. <laughs> I'm dressing like you now. Oh, no, me, I've gone <laughs> always the African way. Yeah, you, you, need, you need the follow suit. Since you left the um, embassy, <laughs> yes. I've never seen you in a suit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Deliberate? Occasionally, yes. But, um, you know, I introduced the Friday wear mm. during my term of office under President Kufo's administration. And the whole objective was to get us as a people to be proud of what we produce. Mm. And that initiative alone gave a strong stimulus to the textile industry, mm. to our tailors and seamstresses. So you've made it now and every day where? Because yeah, today is no, not Friday. No, actually, it was an entry point strategy when okay. I said Friday way. Right. Because you know Ghana, I was so conservative. Mm. So I, I wasn't sure whether if you made it every day where from the beginning, mm. that people would buy into it. Wonderful. But um, once people got comfortable with so it. So is this made in uh, Ghana? Oh, yes, this is made in Ghana. All yes. the things you wear are made in Ghana. Yeah, now I, I, as much as possible, I tried to do Ghana. so. Did you deliberately choose this week to announce this? Because it's been a very interesting week. On Chrome's birthday, yeah. young people wanted to march to the Jubilee House with a very interesting name for a demonstration. Yeah. Police initially didn't want to agree. It was a big rain on Friday. And then on Monday, you gave us a big shocker. So was that like part of the plan? Oh, no, no. I, I know people have tried to link it with the demonstration. But, I mean, I know this is normal in politics. You know, people try to feed off different mm. uh, incidents. But it had nothing to do with the, the demonstration, nor the rain. Mm. You will recall that um, on the 5th of September, mm -hmm. I issued a press statement <coughs> indicating my decision mm -hmm. to exit from the process mm -hmm. of selecting the next flag bearer of our party. Mm -hmm. But I also indicated in the press statement that in the upcoming weeks that I'll make a statement about what I want to do uh, in politics in Ghana. So I'd already put that on the radar. And I indicated that I was going to have some consultations. And after that, uh, I would make a statement. So the date was pre-selected. It wasn't an opportunistic no, choice. No, no, on no, the basis no, no, of, no, no. Fair enough. Yeah. But having been with the party for 31 years, since yeah. its inception, yeah. how do you feel sitting in front of me today, a day after saying, Yetun Kwanta Apai? Look, um, I think my statement speaks for itself. Mm. Uh, it's been a chain of events that provides the historical context for the decision that I've made. You know, sometimes people try to read their own personal interest into this whole story. But if you read the text of my statement, you get a sense of why the decision I have taken. Because even before I went into the substance of what I'm seeking to do, I made it clear in the beginning that I was providing the historical context mm. that had occasioned the, the press conference. So you find the reasons there. And sometimes I think we should not use executive time uh, to go back in detail. But uh, maybe just in summary, uh, you, you are aware that I've played a leading role in our party. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a founding member, and I still am a founding member. Because you don't lose your status 
because you uh, come out of, of the party. And indeed, interestingly, when the party itself was formed, the leading members at that time were all uh, gentlemen who had either come back from exile, from exile either from Nkrumah's regime or the subsequent military regimes, or they had come back from prison. So you had a new political party established with a leadership that were financially incapacitated. And that was a major problem. At that time, fighting against an establishment, well-oiled, you know, and driven by somebody like Rawlings, it took a group of young men, businessmen, professionals, who at that time had very strong uh, financial uh, standing to take a decision to come together to provide the financial with what where they would all the mm -hmm. financial backbone to support the party. That was the Young Executive Forum. And I was the chairman of the Young Executive Forum. 80% of the heavyweights that you find in the party now, and even before, all came to the Young Executive Forum. Baridu, when I was chairman, Baridu of blessed memory was my Secretary. Uh, secretary. Peter McMahon, Kandapa, Cecilia Dapa. So these are Cor contemporaries. Courage Kwashiga. All of them. Uh, Osage was foreign minister. The Marengi of Otunfo, Santihne. Um, uh, he was there, Dr. Osei. And um, Mr. Osei can come. Uh, a, a number of people. Uh, Su Benin, uh, Mr. Moses Osei Bozu. So you had a number of people who put their weight behind the party right from the beginning. I mean, literally, this group was the one that financed the whole of Adubuayi's campaign. In fact, MPP's campaign going to 1992. And I was their chairman, Japan, not to forget Kwabla Japan. Uh, so this is 92 to 94. This was 92, yes, right from the beginning. 92. So we went into it right from the beginning. And on account of the fact that I was the chair of the, uh, of the Young Executive Forum, I was then, on account of that, a member of the National Executive Committee, National Council. You know, I was a big man. At a young at that age. Time, even at that time. Yeah. And that went on until 1996 when the Young Executive actually nominated me to contest as the as one of the uh, presidential uh, aspirants because at that time we had a muzzle in the party and they felt that the party needed that kind of charisma and uh, energy to contest against somebody like a uh, rollins and so they nominated me and we went on for some time and it was uh, stephen Kreku. Um, very senior member of the party, uh, Apia Menka, a few others who called me and prevailed upon me uh, to allow the, the older... Uh, so as uh, early as 1996, as early did as you 19... have the ambition or they were just... When they said to you you should run, was this something you had been considering? Oh, I wouldn't say that at that time. I was very active in the party, having been a founding member. But at that time, it was not my ambition to contest for the flag bearership uh, of the party. I was chairman of this very powerful group. We wanted to put our weight behind any candidate who we thought uh, would represent the interests of our tradition. Now, the only reason why they nominated me in 1996 is because they felt that fighting against Rawlings needed uh, somebody who had a certain kind of persona, and they thought that I would, uh, uh, I would be the right person, you know. So I've been in this game since that time, when people start talking about the latter-day saints. I mean, I, because the impression is created that uh, yeah. your nomination to be the ambassador to the U.S. and then coming back to be a trade minister, it, it appeared 
that you were an outsider who had been propelled yeah. and that your rise to the flag bearership yeah. in almost flag bearership 2007, 2008 was almost like a short circuiting of a process. Yeah. So not many in the media know this, this story. Was that why you put it in the yeah, statement because, yesterday? Yeah, because the fact is that people have misread deliberately the history of our party and have decided that they will create their own story. And that, oh, Alan just emerged, he was like, he was, he was discovered by Kofo. Yeah. And I think that... So you've heard that before? To be fair to President Kofo, mm. he really detests that particular narrative. Why? Because in 1992, when as a founding member we supported the party, we, I worked through till 98, and the United Nations, UNDP in particular, asked me to come and lead the whole enterprise development agenda for Africa. And I, I was... Uh, I was stationed in New York. My mm. office was in New York. So mm. I was in charge of enterprise development for Africa, for UNDP. Mm -hmm. But I made a case to the UNDP that I cannot sit in New York and superintend over the development of the private sector from New York. So I made a case that I'll relocate my office to Ghana. Oh. And, and they agreed. So at the time in 98, when I set up shop uh, as a director for Enterprise Africa, I was still very active. Is that illegal, working for the UN and doing MPP politics? Uh, but but <laughs> well, you mean, you think those sitting there <laughs> in the UN, it, 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 mean, it depends on what you are doing. Because at that time, remember, uh, this was during Wallace's regime. And as long as you are not engaged in active uh, uh, politics, you are free to, 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 to do whatever you do in your country, as long as it does not conflict uh, with, with your work. So 98, as you know, uh, this was a different era. But I'm now talking about the work that we did up to 2001 when we came into office. So remember then that all that time I had, I was, I had a very strong professional standing uh, on my own. And President Kufour was aware of it. And I, made, I, I played a, a, a key role mm. in helping the party uh, to come to us. Because as I said, I started in 1992. We are now talking about 2001. So when President Kufour won the election, mm. I was the first person that he offered an appointment as on, on account of my capacity and competence. So that is not uh, President Did he Kufour. offer you a ministerial role? Yeah, ministerial role, right when from you, the when beginning. You won. Right from the beginning. And uh, maybe, I don't know whether this is confidential stuff, but right from the beginning, I declined uh, to accept a, uh, the ministerial offer from uh, President Kufo, and I knew he was not happy with it. But I'm saying this to his credit, because this propaganda that has been going on for a very long time, that Kufo, I mean, discovered me and tried to impose me on the party, is completely false and is, it, doesn't, it doesn't have any... Because problem. a lot of the yeah. media see the first list of Kufo ministers. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, before that, the 96 yeah. parliament... Yes had the stalwarts, Nana yeah. Kufado, Kufi Apreku, yes, yes, Osafo Mafu, J.H. Yeah. Mensa. Yeah. You were not in parliament in 96. No, 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 I was not and in parliament. And then when he came yes. and offered ministerial positions, yeah. we did not know that you were given a ministerial position. Yes. So, so that, I'm telling you. So, so the point is that the first thing we knew was that you were ambassador to U.S., which no, is also so, a big position. No, no, I'm telling you what no, actually I, I, happened. I agree. I understand. I'm, I'm trying to explain to you yeah. the, the way the perception the became. The perception came, yes. And so that by the time you became minister in 2003, yes, yeah. it, it appeared there had been already well-established people. I agree with you. Yeah, but you, 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 the, the answer to that lies in the belly of what you are saying. Because I was a U.N. official, 
I was working in the background. You understand me? Yeah. So you are right in saying, but remember that previously I was still uh, the chairman of the Young Executive Forum. But because I was a UN official, I was working in the background. So that is why you would not have heard or seen Alan in the forefront. So when people start talking about, oh, we heard uh, Nana Kufwadu's name, Aprekus name, you know, that explains it. So you're saying that prior to your appointment in 2003 as trade minister, yes. you had been a co-member of both the party yeah. and also the government by being ambassador to US. So yeah. you are not a new face in the Kufour government when he announced your appointment as trade minister. Absolutely. And just for, for the purposes of record, I was one of the most important figures in the MPP right from 1992. And as I explained to you, on account of my being the chairman of the Young Executive Forum, I was also a member of the National Executive, a member of the National Council. And in fact, if you look at the most important sector committees, I was part of uh, all those committees. I was a member of the Finance Committee. There was an Economic Sector Committee made up of all the economic groups at that time, Kwame Joseph Rata, and I was the youngest member of that team at that time. This is all from 1992, you know. And the build-up to 2000, as I said, I was very much involved. The reason why you were not hearing my name, as you've rightly pointed to, maybe you were hearing Nanel Kufuado, uh, uh, Dr. Prekum, is because as a UN official, I did not project myself uh, openly, openly whilst in opposition. Yes, but, yes, but Alan, yeah. the, the other reason people considered you favored yeah, was that yeah. ambassador to. Oh, but I'm coming to it. Amb I'm, ambassador I'm, to US. Yes, is a very important. But, but I'm for going the government. to. I'm going to explain to you. Yeah. So working in the background, but still a very important yeah. uh, part of the process. Mm. Up to the point where 2001, President Kofu won. Now, because of my stature in the party at that time, I was the one that President Kofu asked to chair mm -hmm. a team to select or nominate ministers for his consideration. I'm to now chair telling a committee. I'm now telling you proper history. Mm. I mean, if I was somebody just, you know, which committee included people like who? Look, he had. The people who were working out in the field openly with him, Kojom uh, Pianim, who later on became chief, chief of, of staff, uh, uh, Sechla Bankwa, uh, uh, Kwame Sapon, who was CMB chair, uh, Dr. Makoto for openly, Tommy Ametekpo, those frontline guys who were with him. When finally he won, I'm talking about. So this was like, the Kufuor core yeah, kitchen, kitchen cabinet. While in opposition. Kitchen into cabinet. The campaign. Kitchen cabinet. But you were when, chairing the committee. When finally power came, within the last like, uh, months of weeks, I was the one he called to chair a committee to consider ministerial appointments. Wow. And all the big guys who were really in his kitchen cabinet, they were all part of the committee, but I was chairing. The first round of discussions we had, I made it clear that I was not interested in being part of the cabinet because I wanted to stay back and allow other people to take up uh, any positions. So when finally we sent the first list of ministers to uh, president, I hadn't seen him so frustrated and disappointed because somehow it was full of people who had been working with him and was very displeased with that. So I, being the chair, I went with one of his closest associates, Tommy Amomateko, to present this list to him. The first question he asked is, Alan, why is your name not on the list? And I told him directly, now, Mr. President, I will stay out. I don't need a job. 
so that when things are going wrong, I have the courage and confidence to tell you that you are going wrong. And so I've allowed the others mm. who have been working with you to be considered for ministerial appointment. The reason why you realize that his first set of appointees were people who were even working against him and who had opposed in the campaign in the campaign and everything because he believed that in all fairness this was not the time to grant favors to his kitchen cabinet but rather try and bring the party together by inviting even people who are against him into his cabinet and that's how come he changed the entire list but he was never happy with the fact that I was refusing. So who proposed to take a, U.S. ambassador? I'm, I'm coming. Ah, now the, the, we are now cooking the meal, and okay. you want to eat? Since we don't have all day. Yes. <laughs> so no. So I'm saying that it was when I rejected the offer of minister. appointment of minister. Then he came back about three months after that because I was still supporting him and said that. I'm not pleased with the fact that you didn't take up this appointment. But now that I'm on the seat, I've seen that there's one appointment that is going to determine whether I fail or succeed. And that's the position of the US ambassador. So I'm pleading with you, this one, you have to accept it. And you realize that I was still shifting. He had to go and convince my wife to convince me to accept the position. I'm putting this on record because people have been unfair to President Kufo that he was trying to do a coronation of them. So later on when I accepted to go to the United States as ambassador, people were still reading into it that it was a strategic move for me to go to America and then go and prepare me and come back. Whilst I was in Ghana, before going to the US, three months into his assumption to office, I told him that, Mr. President, if you want to leave a legacy, you have to do monumental things. You have to do big things. But those big things should be things that would transform our economy first. So let us select four strategic sectors of the economy and then put all your weight behind those sectors. Mm. If nothing else happens in your administration, the four sectors will be the sectors that will create a legacy for you. And I will brand that program that it is the president's own initiatives. So I introduced the presidential special initiatives, four of them. Cassava, meaning industrial starch produced from cassava, garments for exports, oil palm, and then industrial salt. And next time we have a conversation, I'll tell you we'll why. Come, we'll come to that. Why I did all those selections. And was this as trade minister? Or this no, was even before? I'm saying two, three months into. Into, into it. So before he convinced me to go into the, uh, Diplomatic to the position of, uh, yes, I had already initiated this vehicle, this special purpose vehicle, first time it was introduced in Africa, mm. uh, in Ghana. And so I was coordinating the PSIs wow. once in Ghana. So it, when, even when I went to the United States, I still had a team working in the office of the president on the PSIs because it was a sub, special delivery program. Mm. Now, it was when I was in the U.S. that President Kufour asked me to come back as minister to come and continue to nurture the baby that I had. So this is the background to your becoming trade minister yes. in 2003. We'll take a short yes. break. We're yeah. on the point of view. We're talking to Alan okay. Mateng, yeah. who has announced an independent presidential bid to lead a movement for change in Ghana. We're trying to understand some of the issues around his resignation, look at his vision for Ghana, and how he hopes to transform the country. Stay with us.
I just took a shower above the clouds. You know why? Because this is the Emirates A380. Finally, anyone can become a household. Oh, wow. Yeah. Salut, <laughs> you will flip a real estate gaming platform that allows you to play and stand a chance of winning a house or cash or consolidated yeah! funds, such as savings towards a house. Simple and easy to play. Visit www.yougoflip.com Buy a ticket to enter the game. Wait for the end of the game to enjoy the win. Anyone can win. Flip it or own it. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the Gaming Commission of Ghana. Play responsible, not for persons below 18 years, and gaming can be addictive. Emirates Premium Economy. One day, all airlines will have seats like this. Fly Emirates, fly better. Intestinal worms may cause itching, abdominal pains, loss of appetite, and anemia. <laughs> Intestinal worms may enter the body through improperly cooked foods, dust, or contaminated soils. Wormplex 400 is an effective dewormer for both adults and children and can be taken at any time of the day. It is recommended to deworm periodically. One tablet of Wormplex 400 kills intestinal worms, roundworms, hookworms, tapeworms, and other intestinal worms. I recommend Wormplex 400 to you because it has worked for my family. Lactating mothers, pregnant women, and children under two years should consult their physician before taking Wormplex 400. Wormplex 400. Wormplex 400. Wormplex 400. As soon as not harmful. This advert is FDA approved. Just close the doors and you're in a world of your own. Travel is not just about the destination, it's also about how you get there. Fly Emirates, fly better. Welcome back. We're still on the point of view with Alan Chermatting. Fascinating history around the transition and the role he played. Chaired a committee to actually choose the first batch of ministers. Many people didn't know this. The other point that has been circulated around that issue is that, of course, you are the, one of the few ministers who did not have a change after you became trade minister in the two terms. Yeah. Osafu Mafu was changed. Nanado was changed. Almost all of them had a change. Ban Redu had to come yeah. in. Yeah. You were preserved as trade yeah. from 2003 to 2008 yeah. when President Kufour left. Yeah. So some people use that again as another sign that you were his favorite person. Mm -hmm. You were the favored, um, you, you were a Kufour favorite. Yeah. Is that true, by the way? You, you, I, I may not be able to speak for him, but it may not necessarily be untrue. However, it is... It is unfair to President Kofor for people to have or are now creating the impression that because I was a f favorite, he did all in his power to, as it were, install me as a hair apparent. The reason why I say so is that in 2005, all the people who eventually contested they have started doing underground moves and operations. I had made up my mind at that time, this post-2004, 2005, that I would contest. When I went to him to inform him that I have an interest and that my other colleagues have started moves under, undercover, if he sees that I'm also operating, he should not be surprised about that. His advice to me was that, wait, do your work. If people feel that you are the right person, they themselves 
would promote you. I went back three months after. I said, big brother, people are campaigning openly. So I want to serve you notice that I'll be going. What he said is that, well, I cannot stop you. But I want to tell you that I will not support you. If there are any people that I will support, there are four people. Anna Kufuado, he was the first person he mentioned. Adu Mahama, Nanos Papo Sankuma, and then yourself. Any of you, if you win, bless my soul, I'll be happy. He said this to you. Oh, yes. You know, sometimes because of the negative propaganda and the implications of this vile propaganda, sometimes you have to come out and Nana speak. Kufuado. He mentioned Nana Kufuado first. Papa Osu Ankuma. Ali Mahama. Second was Ali Mahama. His vice. Papa Osu Ankuma. And myself. He told me plainly that he's not in a position to support me. That any of these four people, he will not do anything directly to support any of them. But if any of these four people, if you succeed, you'll be happy with it. So it was on that basis that we all carried on. It is, it is totally untrue that, that he was working against any of these candidates. The impression is that Anna Kufuado had contested Kufu earlier, yeah. and therefore, having lost to Kufu and then having uh, the, 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 the space open, yeah. he was next in line. Yeah. Are, are you a contemporary of Anna Kufuado in that sense, or were you next after Nanado? Oh, no, I, I would say that um, in the sense of the trend or the t tradition that had been set at that time, having contested against President Kufo, that it would have been perceived that it was next in line. And not be wrong. They could have perceived that and not be wrong. Yeah, not be wrong. In fact, that was the basis for, I think, the Yenumu Frititi subsequently. Mm. So, the 17 aspirants, we all went into this uh, contest in 2007 on that basis. You know, the fact that I may have been his favorite, that might have been his personal decision. You know, but when you yielded after the first round in 2007 mm -hmm. for the sake of peace, did you feel that was a sacrifice that needed to be respected by the party to the extent that when a post Nanado contest comes up, there should be some acknowledgement of that. I had no intention of tying it into a post Nanako Fuado. My intention, as, as I declared at that time, was that I believed that I was very strong in the party, mm. that I commanded the grassroots of the party, and that was reflecting in the fact that in spite of the stature of the other 15, 16 uh, aspirants, I was second. I remember the orchestration that had been done to create this favor against me. You remember during the 2000, you know, something happened, all kinds of accusations. In spite of all that, I still was second. So I made that sacrifice to avoid the disintegration of the party at that time because it was a hotly contested uh, uh, primaries and my sense was that going into a runoff which i could have won going into a primary will further deepen the the, the the woes of the and it was out of respect for uh at that time and also for my love for the party that was why I made that sacrifice. I was not tying it to the fact that, let's say, after him. So, but if yeah. people wrongly perceived, based on what you're saying, that yeah. President then I, Kufour was doing everything to install you, yeah. can the current vice president not say the same? That is a wrong perception. That the president has never come out to say he's supporting him. He's built his own base. And yeah. yet there is a perception. Indeed, yeah. the statement said that 
everything has been tactically and strategically skewed yeah. for one person. And yeah. we all know we are referring to yeah. Dr. Babomia. Yeah, well, I, I use those words. The strategically and tactical skewing now has no resemblance or comparison to Kofuor's time. What did Kofuor do? If I ask anybody about exactly what did President Kofuor do to show openly that he wanted to install me, I doubt whether, you know. But Kofuor hasn't done anything to show that well, he openly wants to support. I, I cannot talk about that. I am saying that if we had time and we went into uh, the, and let's leave uh, the president out of this. We are now talking about the ecosystem, the structure. But that's what people were saying. What yeah. my point is that it's the same thing. In 2007, yeah. you would, the president will not come out to yeah. openly support anybody. Yes. But the ecosystem around the party and the yeah. government will support yeah. one person. Yeah. So they're basically saying it's the same thing that's happening now where the ecosystem appears to be pushing one person. Yeah. The president spoke to us on the day of voting. Yeah. He spoke to my colleague, Judy, says, yeah. I haven't supported anybody. Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about when they directly ask him if you support yeah. anybody. Yeah, but let us not, as, as lawyers, we say, let us, live, not, let, let us not lift the veil. <laughs> you understand me? All I'm saying is that even as somebody who was supposed to be a beneficiary <laughs> of favoritism, I did not see it. At that time, mm. I did not see it. And if people are being fair to President Kofor, I'm not sure that what is going on now can be compared to <laughs> what, what happened at that time. So here, the evidence is, is there. I mean, when I say evidence, I'm saying that if we had time and we're going into the details, and I made allusions to... Uh, some of the things that... Uh, Just a final point was, do you feel that the elders of the party mm -hmm. ought to be more outspoken? Because you have said that there's intimidation, monetization, the level of that in the history of the MPP is unprecedented. Yeah. You're basically saying the party is facing almost an existential crisis of a proportion never seen in its life. Yeah. We still have President Kufu alive. Yeah. Hakman is still alive. Osafo Mafu is still alive. There are some very senior members of the party. Yeah. Michael Kuhu is still alive. Yeah. We, we have not heard them come out openly to call for a truce yeah. or say anything, from, from the outside at least. What's your view about that? If, because again, in your time, in 2007, 2008, we did see some strong voices speak out at yes, least. at that time. Yes. I'm happy you are saying this. Have you heard the same voices? No, now I'm asking your view on that. No, I'm saying that. At that time, there were some strong views. And I think, was it Boache Jakun? Oh, yeah, somebody made that point that at that time it was 16 against uh, Alan. It was clear. Now, you are saying that you haven't heard the elders of the party speak about what is happening now. Now, I cannot answer for them. The chairman of the National Council, no, no, Council, Council of, of Elders. Elders. Hackman. Hackman yes, my, my, my senior brother, yes, Hackman also Hackman. He contested with us in 2007. He's now Council of Elders. I appeared before the Council of Elders. I made it clear to them what I feel about what is going on in the party. And no one can tell me that the elders of the party do not know that what we fought for to bring the party into existence eh, is not being compromised now. It is an open sick. Everybody knows about what is going on now. But if people don't have the courage to talk about their status and state, I mean, state of affairs, you only, with time, you will pay for that. Is that more evidence of the politics we do now, or is just maybe they, they, are, they, are, they, are, they, they don't have the, the, the car? Because you, you did also say that there are people behind the veil, and then there are apparatchiks. So it, you seem to be suggesting that the nature of the party and the kinds of people in control of it is not the same as it was maybe two Very much so. Very much. You, are you not aware, or you have not heard, that there are people behind the curtain 
who have more influence in governance now than even uh, ministers. You have not heard. No, I mean, now that you are asking, you have not heard about people behind the curtain who have significant influence and control in the party. When we started in 1992, where were they, the so-called behind the curtain gentlemen? Mm. So, you know, that if people don't want to, I mean, I have, and sometimes my, my own friends think that I'm too calm, I'm too gentle, you know. But, I mean, that's how it should be. You know, politics is not for the rancors. Or, or, so that's how it should be. And I'll try and keep to that. But when I have to make sure that I speak against things that do not augur well for the nation, I'll do so. I pick my fight. Tactically, your yes. campaign team said to us that your real base was the 200,000 yeah. and that the super delegates was just a selection yeah. so that it was just a question of being in the top five. Yeah. Some of those 200,000 who supported you will feel yeah. let down that you've left yeah. because they could have said, look, when we get to the real voting, they will vote for you. But you've left them in the ledge. I, I disagree with my own team. They kept on making some of these statements. This a Drew Usu thing. I kept on telling them that you're underselling me by making it seem as if oh, Alan is just sitting there and he feels entitled to it. And so, you know, I, I kept on telling them that is not the kind of label befitting somebody who has worked to deserve, you know, to lead the party. So I disagreed with them on even the Adroso label. And I disagreed with them also on their own understanding of what you are now uh, referring to that, oh, the super delegates, you can already predict where the allegiance will be, and that if it gets to 200,000. That's why, in my earlier statement in Executive, I said that the value will be the same. It's not going to change because the, the delegates, this is the 200,000, who put them there? It's the same establishment. Who, who controls those 200,000 people, you know? So I kept on telling my team that my strength does not lie with the 200,000 people. My strength lies with the rank and file of the party. And when we talk about the rank and file of the party, it's not the 200,000 people. 6.5 million and over vote for MPP I mean, in, 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 in our elections, S over 6.5 million people. They are the strength of the party, not the delegates. You know, so my attraction for me is the larger group, you know, outside. How many, how many people do you think are registered members, card-bearing members of MPP? How many? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it's up to 500,000. So, so, so your point so, is that no, so even is, if the, it's, is, the, is the party voters, the supporters, if it's, not the members that's the, the point. Delegates. Even if it's one million mm. registered card members, yeah. the, the 5.5 million people who vote for MPP, many of them are sympathizers mm. and they are watching. They may not be card bearing members, but they are the ones who actually vote for MPP, including floating voters who vote for MPP. So if people are sitting in national headquarters and making, making big claims that O'Alan can leave, it will not affect the party, I leave it to their own judgment. Because the 6.5 billion people minus the leadership now and the 200,000 people, go and talk to them. And they'll tell you eh, whether Alan has no influence in the NPP or not. Just a final point on this, yeah. because from 2007, when we look at percentage of your results, you were close to 40%. Akufado had a bit of 49 or yeah. something. The 2010 primary, 2014, yeah. your numbers have been diminishing. So there appears to be a decline 
for Alan within the MPP, whatever electoral college they use. Mm -hmm. you've, you've done many means. You've done the one where you all met at Legon. You've done the super delegates in 2014. Yeah. And the point is that your proportion against Akufadu has diminished all through. So th th there's a view that this is a man whose popularity in the party is already on decline. Yeah. Well, I'm happy. I'm happy you're saying that there's a view and that you don't hold the same no, view. No, I'm just looking because, at the numbers. No, no, because others would the have been... The numbers speak for no, themselves. No, I understand. I would have been disappointed. But I'm saying that you are only saying that there's a view. Look, those statistics don't mean anything. Because I've told you that this party... Remember after Kufo, when you say establishment, the establishment is controlled by whom? The establishment in the party. Who, is, who controls the establishment in the party now? So whether it is the superdelegates or the so-called larger group of delegates, the point that I'm making is that if they vote in primaries, and, and because from 2007 in the primaries, these are all delegates. Delegates don't determine the real stature and popularity of people in a party. That's the point I'm making. So the arithmetic that, uh, very respectfully, you are echoing has no basis in reality. Because if, for example, like it is happening now, if the system, the leadership orchestrates that Alan should get zero in a particular uh, region or get next to nothing in an, in an election, how is that the, the true? Of the party, how is that the true reflection? But the leadership of the party has changed from 2010. Yeah, Afoko was chairman before yeah. Kwabene Japan secretary before yeah. John Buedu's team came with Freddie Blay, yeah. and now we have Justin Kodria, yeah. and then of course Stephen Tim. So my point is, in the you, 15 you missing, years, you no, I'm missing, okay. unless you're yeah. saying that the establishment is the candidate and not the leadership of the party, because we're talking about your your electoral fortunes within the party, yes. and yeah. these eternal elections yeah. are held yeah. by the leadership of the party yes which yeah. i have showed you has changed yeah, yeah. from uh, afoko at japan to blay uh, uh what's his name john yeah. do all through to in team and 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 justin and within that period yeah. the trend is still downwards yes yeah but i'm saying that who controls the party who controls the party i, I don't know you are in the party I, <laughs> so, oh, you were so, in the so party. That we don't need we don't need to get into uh, that, that, that discussion. All, right, fair, fair all I'm saying is that, all yeah. I'm saying is that whether you have changes in the, so, because you, when you say leadership, you are talking about, let's say, national officers. The national officers don't constitute the leadership of the party. It is wider than that. Mm. It is wider than that. So I'm saying that the broader group of leadership in the party have been in existence and continued up to now. Mm. So if it is anybody by Allah, why is it that even from 2005 up to 2008, I have told you that I'm a self-made man. If peop people feel that it was Kufour who was creating an Alan and is trying to install an Alan. And that enmity that has been built over the time against my person has existed from that time to now, based on a false premise. Mm. This is the point I'm making. Do, do you it's based on a false premise. And they are being unfair to President Kufour. So what I'm saying is that the anti Kufour sentiments in the party is what is creating all these problems. I have nothing to do with but they've tied my apron strings to that of Kufour unfairly. Now, if you hate President Kufour, how has that got to do? I tell you, why do you hate President Kufour? He's the most successful leader of our party. No, there has been no doubt about that. In history. Why in history? Of course, now we are talking up to now. You, you understand? So why are people having that sentiment against me because all this is a carryover and that's why it was good we're explaining these things there's nothing i have done to give anybody do you do you, do you feel you're a victim of the party leadership's view that 
they need a, 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 a northern presidential candidate to dispel the tag that MPP is an Akan party. And that, that could have informed the perception that the leadership has that they want somebody other than you. No, it is all choreographed, engineered thinking. I mean, mm. are they not going to talk tribalism in our party? Is that what they want to do? What, what kind of argument is that? What kind of argument is that? I don't even want us to waste executive time to discuss that. If that is their view, and I've heard very senior members of our party talking about the, the point you are making reference to, oh, that we need to have somebody from another tribe. What kind of logic, political logic is that? What kind of political logic is that? So if that's what is inducing the near coronation uh, you know, uh, exercise, well, God bless the party. But it's a very important point that you've made. You know, and I know people are hiding behind that agenda. It is anybody but Alan. And it is anybody but Alan because they think that Alan is a creation of Kufo, which is completely untrue. And I know that... But I thought you and Kennedy and the other nine were on the same side because in the meeting prior to the voting, at least the understanding we had was that nine of you wanted things to be done a particular way. Yeah, yeah. So we felt from outside that at least we are singing from the same hymn sheet on the rules. A Jakun, yourself, a Free, a Kennedy, yeah. all of you except the vice president. So the, the, the question though is what's your... Why Alan? If, if anybody else... Why should it be about Alan? Because there's also Kennedy there, there's a Jaku there. Why should the favoritism for somebody be a question of an anti-Alan agenda? Well, Why isn't it an anti-Kennedy uh, agenda or an anti Jaku like, agenda? Like, like I'm saying, we need more time to get into this. But all I'm saying is that that is the basis for the confusion in the party. Mm. I'm telling you, that is the real thing. This whole thing, it is from two times when people perceived that uh, President Kufo was trying to install somebody there was no basis for it. It has carried on, and people now are kind of feeding into it. You know. Mm, but okay. like I said, hey, I, I, I was part of the founding members of the party. Mm. I've paid my dues to the party. I believe in the traditions and the value of the party. But if things are going wrong, mm. I can only commit to remain come for a certain time. But when it is going to jeopardize the very existence of our party, which is where we have got into now, I will not stay and countenance that. After all, I'm not a young man. I can make my own decisions. I have a very distinguished record in my profession locally and externally. You know, so I don't waste my time on matters like this. We'll and back. that's why mm -hmm. I'm give, making, I mean, I'm giving a caution to the party leadership that if they want to play that kind of game by trying to discredit me about what has gone on, it will not be an interesting When we come exercise. back, we'll look at why an independent candidate, whether the third force agenda can work, and what real message does he have for the people beyond the delegates now that it's now a general election? Stay with us. Wow, I'm not sure if there's anything else we can say, but this is just part one where we've been dealing with some key issues around the man, how he became a member of the MPP, some of the issues that led to his resignation and how he feels about the current leadership. There's a part two coming up later where we'll now go into his views about some current economic activities, some current economic issues, what his plan is, how he intends to run, can the movement he started break the MPP NDC duopoly and is he the man to lead that change all of those issues coming up in the next interview that we'll be showing in our next show thank you for watching we hope you've enjoyed it this has been a special edition of the point of view with Bernard Avle we'll see you next time bye bye <laughs>